everyone. Good afternoon. We are going to get started now. So thank you for bearing with us for a couple minutes. Um, first of all, I just want to say, again, a wonderful opportunity to have this more intimate discussion on a very, very important topic, and one that even those of us who spend a lot of time discussing global education oftentimes don't seem to have enough time discussing this particular topic in per um, in detail. So again, we are going to be screening and launching an exciting new film called Voices of Teachers from Conflict Zones. Right now there are 75 million children in countries facing war. And when conflict or natural disaster erupts, education is usually the first thing to be suspended and the last to resume. Governments are often overwhelmed by the immediate needs uh, the, the most desperate needs of individuals and oftentimes uh, the, the traditional focus on those specific needs will interrupt education and um, what is interesting is that if you look at the entire envelope of humanitarian spending ready for this statistic this is a good one to tweet only 2% is spent on education and emergencies so that being said Oftentimes, teachers are some of the most influential voices for equality, for access, and for quality education, and are key to the sustainable achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Yet, in crisis and post-conflict settings, their roles are often overlooked, with other urgent issues taking greater priority. Qualified teachers are also in very short supply, and female teachers in particular become very difficult to identify, and this has a knock-on effect for girls' enrollment. Many are new recruits with minimal experience or training to pre prepare them for complex, the complex challenges of teaching in fragile settings, and with few resources at their disposition and facing overcrowded classrooms with students having suffered trauma, displacement, hunger, and fear, their burden is a very heavy one. So as teachers play such a critical role in shaping the future of their students and communities, their role should not be an afterthought, but an integral part of preparedness and planning phases for education in emergencies and in chronic crises. And this is exactly why we are here today. Together with colleagues and members from the Post-Conflict and Peace Education Alliance, we are launching Voices of Teachers from Conflict Zones today. This film aims to amplify the voices of these brave teachers, unpack their daily realities, and to listen to what they say needs to change directly from teachers themselves. Plan International Canada is absolutely delighted to have helped in the development and creation of this video, and uh, you will be able to access the link, and we ask you to share it broadly and wildly. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Nadine Grant. Thanks very much, Caroline. Um, I'm the Vice President of Programs at Plan Canada. I'm really happy to be here. I'm also the co-chair of this uh, loose alliance of the Varkey Foundation. Every year at the GESF, the Varkey uh, Foundation establishes a number of loose alliances. Basically, a bunch of people are thrown together with very little, if any, budget um, and uh, asked to address one of the major challenges. Our challenge was peace education and post-conflict education. So we thought, how better to speak to this issue, but from the voice of children, uh, sorry, of teachers in these most remote parts of the world, in some of the forgotten corners, forgotten conflicts. And um, because a video sometimes speaks louder than words, we decided to just put together a short clip. So the Alliance members come from Afghanistan, India, Colombia, Norway, Canada. We are NGO workers, academics, and um, advocates, teacher advocates. So we went to seven countries to uh, prepare this video using handheld mobile devices, just 
cameras on your phone. Uh, we had no training, by the way, as videographers, and um, we just left open-ended questions to hear the authentic voice of teachers. What did they say about their lived experience in conflict zones? Um, these are often overlooked teachers. So just amplifying that voice, as Caroline mentioned, through this modest video. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, a year later, we're really happy to be launching that. And um, to kind of give us a bit more context on the issue, we have this excellent uh, panel here today. Um, I'd like to start with Mohammed first, who you all heard uh, at the plenary. If uh, Mohammed, you could tell us a few words about your experience and um, the importance of teachers uh, when you were going through um, your education in Sierra Leone and beyond. Um, to me, when I started school uh, at age 10, not knowing how to read or write, I was sort of put in a setting where the only outcome was failure. Uh, and I get that most of these programs are good intentioned, um, in this particular case, UNICEF. But when you put people in schools without the right support, uh, it's very likely that they're going to fail. Um, to me, my teaching came from the people who I've met along the way. During the war in Sierra Leone, there was no school. And it's sad, like, the reality is there's always going to be conflict. Call me pessimistic, but there's there always going to be conflict. But what we need to do is we need to understand that there are rules. And within these rules are that we have to protect schools. It's a no-go zone. You leave teachers alone, because at the end of the day, when these conflict happens, knowledge is... The countries have set back decades in the amount of capital that they, that they lose from people not being able to go to school, from teachers not being able to teach. And when teachers do not have the protection that they required, the system becomes chaotic. And then you have a civil war in my country, and people are like, oh my God, poverty created the civil war. And I'm like, no, poverty didn't create the civil war. It's because we did not fund enough education. And I mentioned this earlier that no nation in the world has ever developed economically, socially, or culturally without an educated population. It's a matter of fact. And so, in a more interconnected world, we are left with two choices. We can either protect teachers and make sure that in times of conflict, teachers are allowed to teach, or that we can say like, well, it's happening over there, it's not gonna happen to us because at the end of the day, it is going to happen to us. That's just how connected we are. Um, and in Senegal, other youth and I came up with a statement, a solidarity statement, where we told world leaders at the Global Partnership for Education Summit that as youth, we're not asking you to give us voices. We already have voices. What we're asking you to do is to give us the medium which we can express the voice that we have and which we can help build on our future because well, there are more of us than there are of the older generation, and it's a chaotic world if we do not um, bridge the gap, if we do not bridge the economic gap, the digital divide between the haves and the have-not, between um, the, the, the Western countries and with, within the, the poorer countries. Uh, but yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I think your, your statements this morning were really moving and really got, I think, the audience uh, riveted. And uh, thank you once again for those opening remarks. Um, I'd like to now turn to Yasmin Sharif. She's the director of Education Cannot Wait, which is the first real global movement to um, fund dedicated funding for education and emergencies, a very important organization going forward. So uh, Yasmin, if you have some words to add to this discussion, that would be most appreciate it. Thank you very much Nadine and thank you Caroline and then it's so wonderful to be here. This is such an exciting uh, conference. Um, so I've been asked to say a few words about um, why we need to listen to the people on the ground and um, I think it's, it's, it's a privilege to sit next to Mohammed. Uh, and you didn't go into the details of what you have gone through but I'm thinking about the many wars that I have uh, worked in uh, over the past 30 years, emergencies, crisis countries, and uh, remembering following closely what happened also in Sierra Leone back in the 90s. When we speak about armed conflict and emergencies, it is not 
the regular development situation. These are abnormal environments. They are unspeakable violations and atrocities that are being committed on teachers, students, communities, and an entire nation. I'm just thinking about the example of Sierra Leone. I remember breaking down crying, and I was just a witness to it, of a young mother who had both her arms chopped off by, by, by armed militia, and if she was running, trying to hold her child with those arms bleeding in all directions. And that was so common, the amputations during the war in Sierra Leone about all the, the, the teachers and students that were running underground schools uh, during the Taliban in Afghanistan, knowing that if anyone would discover them, they would all be executed. Or thinking about the little school children in Hebron and West Bank in Palestine who watch executions from the windows of their school, or teachers who don't dare to go through the checkpoints because there are no women soldiers to go through and do the check on them and therefore opt to stay at home and schools are disrupted. Uh, about the bombing of schools in, in Syria, there was not only long ago, there was a whole classroom full of children and bombs hit the school and they all perished. These are abnormalities that we can hardly imagine unless we had been in their shows. And that's why it's so important to listen to them and try to empathize and understand what it means to be in a country of conflict and violence. And then reduce ourselves, I think, and this is very much the, the principle of education cannot wait, to humble servants. What do you need? What can we do to empower you? And when it comes to teachers, when you are a child or a young or a youth in an emergency, one thing that you need, and I think uh, Mohammed alluded to that, you need somebody, somebody that brings you that light of hope, somebody that can help heal your wounds, that can help you away from those suicidal thoughts of having your whole family executed, or can mentor you into a better life and educate you. It's more than just the math and the science, it's to become that role model. And that's the responsibility that teachers shoulders upon themselves. Besides the fact that they themselves are uh, uh, the targets of a conflict, and their schools, their workplace is a target in the conflict, they also have to carry the added burden of healing and helping and, and giving hope uh, to the students. So. Uh, I think we should all bow, bow to, the, to the work and the profession and the supra, supra, supra strength that teachers are expected to provide uh, to the young and, 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 and the young children and the youth in the middle of an emergency. And I, I, I would like perhaps to, to, to end by, by, by saying a quote on this, just to show the way we in education cannot wait. Want to honor all the teachers, and I would encourage everyone to see uh, the, the video that is being presented today of the, the voices of the teachers in, in, in crisis. Someone once said, the universal mission of all educators is to lit the torch of light and to illuminate the world. And that is the role of teachers. And because we are here in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates, I'll also try to say it in Arabic. Shama Modeya. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much, Yasmin. Those were uh, very inspirational words, and uh, makes me want to be a teacher in a conflict zone. Um, the next speaker is Samar. Samar Nazal is a teacher from Jordan and has been teaching robotics and physics to Syrian Palestinian refugees, uh, refugee girls, excuse me, yeah. in UNRWA schools in Erbrid Camp in Jordan. Samar has also been recognized many times for her pioneering work in girls' education, and in 2015, she won the UNRWA Distinguished Teacher Award. She is also a Global Teacher Prize finalist, and um, we'd be delighted to hear your thoughts on this topic. Thank you, okay. Samar. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, voices. Uh, they give me one. Yes, okay. 
but my voice is 25 years teaching, but uh, my voice is still uh, soft. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, just use the mic just in case. Okay. Uh, now I've been teaching in Onorwa. Onorwa, for whom who doesn't know it, it's uh, for a UN for relief and working agencies. For the Palestinian and uh, uh, for the Palestinian, it established since uh, 1949. So it is uh, an pioneer. Uh, sorry, okay. So it is a pioneer leading uh, agency for leading the or teaching the refugees. And uh, the um, uh, I want to say that the, uh, the experiment in teaching the refugees. In this 25 years, it's, um, it's, okay, uh, language, uh, it's make my, uh, sorry, sorry. okay, uh, we teach since 25 years, I teach uh, uh, students, refugees, girls in uh, Jordan, they are came from Palestine, and the last six years we have uh, Syrian refugee girls, and that's make uh, our classes more crowded. I teach classes uh, 45 girls. I teach uh, 23 hours per week. Uh, all, although we have a problem that uh, the girls are uh, in the 14 years old, they are getting early marriage. Uh, the, their parents does not want them to come back to school. They are afraid, of, uh, afraid for them. Uh, so that uh, and the, um, so uh, we have to uh, encourage girls to finish their schools. So can, they can uh, become a teachers or they work, so, uh, and um, they if you if we okay, uh, sorry. Uh, something else I want to uh, call uh, about it. it uh, I am a refugee, and working with Norwa is make me safe me and my families. So I encourage the agencies who is working with refugee to um, to hire a refugee girls. Uh, I refugee teacher, teachers. If you hire a teacher, a female teacher, you're going to save her from abusing, uh, save her children. So I encourage that, uh, and uh, it must be the priority is to a refugee to be working with refugees. That's what I call Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much, Shamar. So I think you can appreciate this has been uh, quite an interesting perspective of our speakers here. Now we'd like to actually show, screen the movie, uh, the video. So if I could ask our technology partners to screen the video for us. And once again, a big thank you to Varky Foundation for supporting the editing of this video, as well as to the members of the, uh, the alliance, um, which are a number of NGOs and academics from across um, a, a, a wide spectrum of countries. And as you watch the video, if you have comments, have thoughts, please use the hashtag teachers in conflict. Hashtag teachers in conflict. <laughs> Hello, my name is Hanan Lehroub. I am from Palestine, and I am the winner of the Global Teacher Prize 2016. I won the award for my methodology, Play and Learn, focusing on providing a safe space in the classroom and embracing the slogan, No to Violence, through my teaching. My experience made me aware that the voices of teachers who are working so hard to provide children a safe education are often not heard. In this film, teachers from around the world discuss the realities of teaching in conflict and post-conflict settings. They share the daily struggles that they face when trying to provide a safe, quality education for children. These are the people who know best how to address these challenges. Children, they use these um, knives, they use guns, because some of them were caught and to the war. What they used to do, they went back to class. Now they don't have the guns, they don't have these knives, so they use their pens to other children. We are only eight caregivers and handling around 
close to 2,000 or 3,000 there children in the school. Dans une zone conflit ou menace ou menacée, les élèves apprennent toujours. Et les élèves sentent toujours euh, la peur. Definitely, अगर हम देखें तो इसकी यानी short term as well as long term में practice है. Short term ये है कि इनका curriculum जो होता है, जो मान लीजिए इनका syllabus होता है, complete नहीं होता है. Children when they 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 first dropped here to the camp, they they felt misplaced. These children do not come from same communities. They come from different communities. وقتی که دریا قریه درگیری باشه و جنگ باشه و اینمی زدن باشه مثلا صدای فیل باشه و صدای تیاره باشه حتما اینمو بالای شاگرد بالای مکتب بالای امو محل منطقه بالای معلمین تاثیر داره انتونسیز ایرا اونو تراتانتو دی مفترلی ها لو مچاچو de hacer que les gustara un poco más el estudio para que se quedaran en la escuela y no se dejaran convencer tan fácil. We need to have guidance and counseling for these children to handle these children in all these aspects. We really need so many, so many teachers to come in. Usme, jese pratek sala ke liye mulbus sumidaye. शासन के द्वारा दी जानी है खासकर मुझे पेयजल की जो व्यवस्था है हमारे यहाँ مثلا به خاطر ماش بگوی یک ماش ناچیز است نخواهیم که بیگان ها بیا دست ما شما را بگیره باید ما خودمان دست خودمان را بگیریم و این بردیم این اوکاسیون رو که Dice, la, la educación no es un gasto, es una inversión. En términos de que si se invierte en educación, se está trabajando mucho por, por la paz. El conflicto profundamente afecta el proceso de enseñanza y el proceso de aprendizaje. La mejor fuente para remover el es la educación. It is imperative that we start investing in education also from the perspective of the teachers. Teachers and their alliances have come together to develop a call to action on the international community and governments. They want them to recruit and fund more teachers, especially females in conflict and post-conflict zones, and ensure they are paid fairly recognize teachers' qualifications across borders, and train and support teachers in conflict and post-conflict zones. Ensure schools are safe and protected from attacks. Collect and report reliable data on attacks on educational facilities to end impunity. Develop and share relevant gender-sensitive teaching materials. And listen to the voices of teachers and local communities in conflict zones. And take action to provide every last child with a safe, quality education. More information can be found at this web address. Does anybody have any questions about the video or to any of the speakers? Yeah, Just present yourself. Um, at GSF? The hashtag is Teachers in Conflict. Hashtag Teachers in Conflict. We'll also be having a more in-depth conversation on education and emergencies in the context of the G7, which will be held in Canada this year. So we'll be having a session that starts, I believe, at 1.30 in the Spice Room, if anyone is interested. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Mike from Ustat Mobile. I had the privilege of living in Afghanistan for eight years. And my question to the members of the panel 
is um, we know that uh, half a million Afghan children are out of school today, not because there's not the money, it's because of ghost schools, it's because of management issues, it's because of corruption that these half a million children whose placements are fully funded are not in school. And without engaging in any sort of the hideous teacher bashing that we sometimes see, we wonder from the perspective of teachers and the perspective of the donors, how do we overcome these horrendous barriers in conflict zones to make sure that the resources that are there get the kids and teachers what they need to have. Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, um, that, that uh, it is asked, but I think it's a very important one, and it's often being raised. Um, I was in Afghanistan, uh, it was actually my first time going to a conflict zone in 1990, and then I was back in Afghanistan with Education Cannot Wait only a month ago, precisely to overcome the barriers um, in crisis. And that's the, the, the special design of Education Cannot Wait, is for emergencies. In Afghanistan, the situation is the following. Uh, you, have, um, uh, you have a humanitarian side, it's on this side, and they, they deliver fast uh, services to the education sector six months at a time. Okay, we all understand that if you do that from the humanitarian perspective, six months at a time, uh, you will never have continuity, you will not have quality, uh, and it will be pretty much piecemeal operation. And that's what happens in emergencies. On the other hand, there is a big trust fund in Afghanistan um, that is meant to work with the government to um, improve uh, procurement processes, uh, address uh, corruption, which is, as you said, widespread, uh, and move a system that is more or less dysfunctional after over 30 years of conflict. And that takes two, three, maybe 10 years to address, 20, if not more. So what do you do, and that refers to your question, when you have six months in uh, some kind of cycle, and then you have something that will take up to 10 years or 20 years to address. What do you do between that? And all the children and the young and the adolescents that are out there who don't receive quality education, it's a big gap to fill. And that's what education cannot wait to do. We work through something called direct execution, meaning we do not channel resources through dysfunctional governments uh, that have not yet put in place the right and efficient structures, not because it's their own fault, but because the crisis, the war, the conflict does not give them the opportunity to rebuild uh, the functional systems and, and accountable systems. So we use direct execution, meaning that our implementing partners who have undergone assessment are implementing accountably on the ground. We bring the humanitarians from this side and the development actors from this side to ensure that we have development humanitarian working side by side to deliver education now. Not next year, uh, not in, in two months at a time, but at least for the cycle of three years that is renewable until the government has built its capacity to deliver education on the ground. And this is what we say, humanitarian speed, we move fast because education cannot wait for all those girls and boys out in the communities in Afghanistan. Humanitarian speed, but with the development depth so that we can achieve sustainable development goal four and have quality education. It's a different modus operandi and a different design, and that is what brings the added value and makes it so unique uh, in our programs. So, so this is what we do as a, as, a, as a mechanism on the ground, especially for Afghanistan. We've just been out there. And I would like to say that the government of Afghanistan they really want this to happen, and they want education to happen now, and they want the girls to be educated, but their own mechanisms and systems do, do, do not allow them to do so, and that's why they, they are very welcoming to the work that we are doing. Thank you. Uh, perhaps a very quick question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Hello. Uh, I'm Nawaz, so basically I work f 
for our, I'm, a, I'm a student. So my question is, why hasn't there been an attempt to try and deliver education through either some sort of vocational training or resource-based learning so that, so that even when a student finishes maybe two or three months of education, he has something delivered at the end of the day because a curriculum-based education would take longer and would not be able to deliver in a conflict zone. Uh, for the curriculum in Jordan, uh, when we teach the refugees, we have a, a parallel one for the, uh, for the, the students in the houses. Uh, be, because they, and sometimes they cannot come to school. So there is a curriculum uh, parallel to that one. They can uh, study it in the homes. So if, um, if they uh, go away from school, they can still be educated in the houses. I, I, uh, that's what we are doing for the UNRWA children, for the Palestinian refugees. Mohammed, do you want to add another word? Uh, yeah, and, I mean, very quickly, knowledge is, is infinite. Knowledge doesn't discriminate against race, gender, nationality, or what have you not. Access and opportunity, however, they're restricted. They're restricted not by what people know, but by the countries that they're from, their nationalities, and the families that they were born into. And so providing that vocational training that you're talking about is this idea of it's not instant, it's going to take time, but I think that the world is now realizing, uh, for the longest time it's always been education is like math, science, and uh, law. It's not that way, I mean, Norway didn't do it that way, and I think the world is learning, and that we're starting to provide these mechanisms that will employ people today, so that come the future, they may be able to send their kids to school. I think we're out of time, but I just want to thank everyone who's uh, been here. And again, um, appreciate the panel and uh, sharing your experiences and thoughts and bringing it to life for us. So thank you. And again, I just encourage you to keep in mind that 2% of all spending in humanitarian situations goes to education. And we are losing entire generations with uh, the youngest cohort of people ever on the face of this earth we have to be able to change that. So again, thank you so much for attending and let's continue to keep the teachers in mind as we look to progress the dial on education. Thank you. Thank you.